I'm going to be talking about our um, past, present, and uh, future research on uh, expected consensus. Uh, let me quickly say that um, uh, this work that I'm about to present uh, was done uh, jointly with our amazing intern, Shui Shao Wang, who unfortunately is not here today, as well as Guy that uh, you already know, and Marco, and really lots of inputs from the rest of the team. Okay, let me take like one step back and just um, think about like Filecoin. So Filecoin is um, like storage-based uh, consensus protocol. So we can think of it as like in different layers, um, top layer, this is really like the Sibyl resistance mechanism. So in Filecoin, like this is based on storage. So basically how we um, we solve like Sibyl attacks is by asking participants to commit some storage to the chain. Uh, this is done using some really cool cryptography that my colleagues at CryptoNet Lab are uh, designing, uh, but we will not be talking about this today because this is Consensus Lab, uh, not CryptoNet Lab, but we are going to treat this as a, as a black box and just assume that um, we have this like Sibyl resistance mechanism that is based on storage. So basically, what we get out of this layer is a list of weighted participants. And then this list of uh, weighted participants are going to rent expected consensus, um, which is one consensus protocol. So you can think of this as um, like the output of this, uh, of like this consensus protocol that is run by this weighted list of participants is a list of order transactions. So today I'm going to be talking about three, like the expected consensus part. Uh, so this consensus protocol. So again, um, you could like any set of like weighted participants could run this. So I'm going to ignore storage, but just know that in Filecoin, participants are weighted according to their storage. Um, just to give you like a, a full picture. Um, Today we talked about a lot about like subnets and IPC. So basically, like subnets, there will be kind of like a, um, a, a different layer as expected consensus. So expected consensus, you can see it as the consensus protocol that is run on the main chain. So if you re remember all the slides where we saw, you know, all the different layers of consensus, like expected consensus is the root root chain. So now let me explain quickly how expected consensus work. So as I said, we have a weighted list of participants. Uh, we call this the power table. And in Filecoin, uh, this um, set of participants is weighted according to storage. Now, like in many uh, consensus protocols, Marco mentioned uh, um, in his talk like uh, earlier today that our consensus protocol, if you ignore storage, is like very, very similar to proof of stake uh, consensus protocol. So um, there is a leader election mechanism. In order to have a leader um, election mechanism, if you want this, uh, this mechanism to be random, then you need to have a random beacon, uh, which is great because we have DRAND, which is a decentralized random beacon. I'm not gonna, I'm done, not gonna touch this during this talk, but just imagine that we have access to, to a perfect random beacon. This random beacon is um, fed to a VRF function, a verifiable function. So basically, each participant are going to compute their own VRF, um, uh, put the random beacon as an input to the VRF, get a random value, and then this is going to tell them whether they are elected or not. So if you are familiar with proof of stake consensus protocol, this is like very similar to leader election in proof of stake consensus protocol. Um, so one difference between expected consensus and other type of consensus, for example, longest chain consensus protocols, is that in expected consensus, which by the way we uh, abbreviate as EC, there are on expectation five leaders that are elected uh, in each round. So they could be more, they could be less, but on expectation that's five. So that's different from most other protocols where there's only one uh, leader elected at each round. Um, and so same, like differently from longest chain pro uh, consensus protocol, in EC, we consider tip sets. So tip sets, they are a set of blocks that all have the same height, so they were all created in the same round, and they also have the same parents. So this is basically how tip sets work. So if you think about ABC, like this is one tip set, one group of blocks, same height, same group of parents, same for DNE, this is another subset, a tip set, excuse me, um, and same for FGH. So, um, so, so you can see that um, instead of having like one block per epoch, we have one tip set per epoch. So really you can think of expected consensus as a mix between longest chain protocols, if you are familiar with us, and DAG-based consensus. 
Um, and then in the unfortunate case of forks, we, we use um, heaviest chain rule. So um, to simplify things a bit, we will choose like any chain, any tip set that has the most block in its sub -dack. So this is like a very high level uh, introduction to, to expected consensus, but really, um, like if you, again, if you are familiar with, with longest chain protocols, which I'm sure everyone is, like this is like a, just a variant of longest chain protocol where we have more than uh, than one block at each round, but each blocks have to have the same parents. Okay, so that uh, being said, let me quickly talk about the pros and cons of expected consensus. So we have five miners that are elected on average, um, which is nice because it means that miners are elected more often than if there was only one miner that is elected on average. Um, so uh, this is nice to have, uh, as this gives like less variance in the leader election uh, mechanism. Um, we know that in proof of work, actually having a high variance is something that is quite undesirable, and especially it leads to like centralization. So actually have it, having less variance is nice, yay. Um, also something that is nice is that private attacks are harder. So private attack is the most simple type of attack. You can think of it as an adversary, that will basically decide to uh, like fork, create a, 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 an alternative chain that it will keep private. So basically the adversary will work on its own chain, the chain at the bottom, while the rest of the network will work on, the, on their own chain as well. So basically we have two chains that grow in parallel. And you see that if you have more leaders that are elected in each round, then basically the chain, that the fork that has the more power, will grow bigger than the chain that has less power, and this will be um, this, this, the difference between the two chains will grow faster in the case of uh, tip sets. So, in if you consider that one block is one tip set, then the difference between the two chains will grow faster. So, this is one, one advantage of um, expected consensus. But sadly, we also have some inconvenience. Um, so one of them is balance attacks. They were uh, introduced in the context of block DAG. I'm going to talk about this a bit more later. Uh, we also have like long finality, so it means we need to we have probabilistic finality. We need to wait a lot for a block to be finalized, for transaction to be finalized. Again, um, this is the same as Bitcoin. We need to wait. Any longest chain protocols protocol has this problem. Um, and also, we have some uh, variants of long-range attacks, which I'm going to give more detail um, about now. So I'm going to be talking about a proof-of-stake system for ease of exposition, but think of um, whatever I'm saying for proof-of-stake, there is like a variant that exists in the context of proof-of-storage. So in a proof-of-stake system, in order to create a block, you just need like signatures from uh, the miners, which we also call the validators. So we can think of it as we need like a quorum, let's say two-thirds of the signature of the validators in order to create a block. So now if you look at my slide, um, imagine that we start with like the green validator, we have like one key that basically represents the quorum of validators. Um, and let's imagine that after some time, these green validators, they decide to leave the system. This happens, uh, people leave, people join. So then we have the blue validators. And next we have the orange validators. This is like a you know, usual, usual life cycle of, of a proof of stake system. So now what could happen is that these green validators, they have left the system, they have sold their stake, they are not interested in the system anymore. Um, so they could, like the adversary could like bribe them to and just buy their key at no cost because these keys have no uh, value, they have zero value at the present time. Uh, this is extremely problematic because as I said, we are in the context of proof of stake, so having access to these keys mean that you can just create a block like instantaneously. So the adversary gets the green key, green key who are the keys from the past validators, then with these keys, the adversary is able to just rewrite an entire alternative chain. Maybe the adversary will uh, simulate some, you know, change in the set of validators. Say like now there is like the red validators or like um, orange and pick one. And um, 
And the issue with this is that if we have some users, Alice, um, that has been asleep, that wakes up and that see these two chains, she has no way of knowing which chain is the correct one and which chain is the adversarial chain um, because both chains are actually valid. Both chains have like valid signatures. So, um, so only the set of validators differ in these two chains, but Alice cannot tell which one is which one. So in order to solve this problem, we uh, propose a solution that consists in checkpointing the stake of the proof of stake chain onto Bitcoin. Uh, so we have a paper, uh, like a protocol called Pikachu. So I'm going to give a very high level description of this. I'm going to later give a link to the paper so you can have a look if you want more detail. But imagine that um, each uh, CI I here is configuration I, so set of validator I. So what will happen is like uh, whenever there is like a new set of validators that join, we will have a checkpoint on the Bitcoin chain from the key PK minus one of the previous validator that's going to transfer all of whatever amounts they have in there associated with their public key to the new public key PKI. And here you can think uh, like PKI represents the set of uh, validator I. And then when we have the configuration CI plus one, we're going to have another transaction that is going to be from the key associated with CI to CI plus one. And the way to think about it is that this transaction and this key PKI minus one, they uh, represent threshold signature. So in order for one of these transactions to be valid, we need to have also a quorum of, of signature. So all of, the, all of the validators, all of the configuration need to agree to send this transaction uh, to Bitcoin. And uh, the idea is that then anyone can go on the Bitcoin chain, start from the initial public key, PK0, associated with the first set of validators, follow the chain of transaction up to PKI, and then basically PKI will give them like information about the current configuration CI. So um, here is like the high level summary, summary of the protocol. We see that periodically we have new checkpoints that are uh, pushed onto Bitcoin. For this, we need a distributed key generation. We need the configuration to create their key, the key that represents like their set. Um, and, uh, and we use Schnorr threshold signature, uh, which is really cool because Bitcoin recently had this taproot upgrade that allows for Schnorr signature. So basically, we can have threshold signature um, that just look like a normal transaction on Bitcoin. So this is great. Um, we also add a CID. Uh, using the op return functionality of Bitcoin. So any participant can use this CID, for example, with IPFS in order to retrieve information relative to the current configuration. So yeah, this is a very high level uh, description of our checkpointing mechanism. I'm not gonna go into more details, but please, if you are interested, check the paper. It is on archive. on archive. I'm also going to present it at Consensus Day in two weeks time. Um, so great, so this uh, piece of research that we did uh, with Marco uh, basically deal with uh, long range attacks. So one problem solved, cool. Now what about the next problem, uh, balance attack? So I said I was um, gonna explain very quickly what they were, so again, they were f like discovered, uh, studied in the context of like DAG chain, so in the context where there is more than one block that is created in each round like we have in EC. And the idea is like it's different from private attacks. If you remember private attacks, I told you that the adversary was creating in, own, in its own chain privately. In this case, the adversary is actually sending blocks to uh, the miners, the, the honest miners, but he's doing so in a way to try and make, and make them mine on different chains. So basically the adversary try, is trying to confuse the honest miners um, on mining on different chains such that they do not reach consensus, such as two chains grow at the same time. Um, and one way like the adversary could do that is by equivocation. So if you look at this slide, you see that the red blocks, they are the blocks from the adversary. You see that we have B1 and B2, and the idea is like the adversary was elected leader, and in order to confuse the honest miner, it equivocated, so it created two blocks, B1, B2, where um, it shouldn't be, like, like the adversary should only be able to create one block. So that's balance attack, very high level. 
So one, um, one suggestion that uh, we are proposing that was led by Guy um, is to implement a consistent broadcast protocol. And having a consistent broadcast protocol allows to prevent equivocation. So basically, what I've just talked about, uh, this scenario where an adversary creates two blocks, B1, B2, even though the adversary was elected only once, um, consistent broadcast prevents this. So this is the current structure of one round in, um, in Filecoin. So basically how it works, um, this is the beginning of the round, which we call an epoch, here Filecoin, and then after some time, there will be like a cutoff, and basically this cutoff will tell the honest validators, um, that's it, um, I stop accepting block for, for this round, I'm gonna you know, build, build my own block and broadcast it. So what, can, what, what happens with this like, cutoff thing is like any block that is received before is uh, accepted and any block that is received after the cutoff is rejected. So if, for example, one node, one node receives like, two equivocating blocks from an adversary, it's going to accept one but maybe like, reject the other one. So how we um, want to solve this is by having this, um, this consistent uh, broadcast and basically we're going to add a second cutoff. So what this means is like before the first cutoff, we're gonna tentatively accept block. And uh, then after this period, after the first cutoff, we're gonna be like, stop, we don't accept block, but we keep like receiving them just to check if we receive any equivocation. And because we are in a synchronous uh, setting, if there was some equivocation, then you should like receive them before, before cutoff two. two. Um, so basically, this is just giving you an extra, an extra time period in order to check, wait, has there been any equivocation? And uh, if there has been, then you will decide to not accept this block. So this is, a, this is an ongoing uh, FIP that we are proposing. So yeah, we believe that this FIP, uh, I mean this proposal, um, really like mitigates balance attacks and all variants of balance attack. So this is great. Now you can see on my slide, we only have one like thumb down left, um, which is long finality. So again, I'm sure all of you know that um, this is the case with every blockchain like Bitcoin, any longest chain blockchain, like we have to wait a long time for block to be finalized. This is annoying. So, um, so now, what, what are we doing about this? We are actually presenting a new protocol called Starfish. So I'm just gonna give you like the intuition behind this protocol. So we want to stay as close as possible as EC because we don't want to have like a big sudden change um, in, in, the, in the protocol. So what we want to do is like as before, in one epoch there are, you know, multiple validators that are elected. But unlike EC, with Starfish, the validators that are elected, they are not going to create a block, they are just going to create a vote. So they are just going to vote for a previous block. And now we're gonna have only um, one person that is elected to create a block, but they can create a block only if they can include in their block like enough votes for the same block. So for example, if you see my slide, um, here we had like five blocks for like this block. Um, so basically any, anyone that is elected a proposer in the next round can just include all these five blocks and create a block. And so the idea is like we have one block with five votes instead of having like five block. Um, then like numbers are just parameters that we are going to tweak. So briefly, why we do, why we think like we should do this, is that be it's because it makes forks harder. Um, again, imagine we are in this scenario, we have a fork, like you know this can happen, can be adversarial or, or non-malicious, and then we're gonna have like multiple, you know, the, the votes are going to be spread on the two blocks. Then like usually what we'll have in EC is like, yeah, you know, we will have a fork here. However, now with Starfish, because we have votes that are spread on two forks, anyone that is elected leader in this epoch will not be able to create a block. Because in order to create a block, you need to have like five votes for the same block. So what's gonna happen is that we need to wait for more votes, you know, in the next epoch to arrive, and only in the next epoch will someone gather enough votes for one block 
and then be able to create a block. So basically, we give extra time uh, for convergence and avoid fork. Um, so this uh, this idea, like Starfish, was um, was um, like inspired by a lot of similar work that has been done. For example, Bobtail maybe is the closest one. Um, Bobtail was in the proof of work case. There's also fruit chain that is kind of related. Um, and also in the proof of stake system, there's a lot of uh, voting mechanism. So, so yeah, th there is quite, quite some related work on this. So this is great. As I said, um, it seems like uh, having forks is harder with Starfish than it is with expected consensus. Um, so, well, I said that I will also present, you know, some future research and actually this is kind of um, some future research for us because we are currently looking at how to uh, formally prove the security of Starfish and um, we, we don't know yet how to do it, we are actively researching this, but, um, but for now our simulation really indicates that this, is, uh, this, has really, this gives really good results, really good finality, so we are hoping to, to have a formal proof soon. So that's it for me. Thank you. And uh, let me know if you have questions. <laughs> uh, can you talk about the scale? So what is the number of nodes that you need to support in the protocol? And what is the frequency with which you have to generate new blocks? So uh, at the moment in Filecoin, we have over 4,000 nodes. And we create new blocks every 30 seconds. And let me maybe just uh, add something. I've talked about like the protocol Pikachu that is doing this checkpointing mechanism. Um, this is also one open problem that we have is like at the moment our Pikachu protocol does not really scale to like this 4,000 work uh, nodes. Sorry. So uh, so when it comes to the checkpointing to Bitcoin, this is, to Bitcoin, this is actually an open problem to make it scale to those 4,000 nodes. Cool. Thank you. In, in terms of the future, what kind of scale do you envision that you will need to support? Um, so I think for yeah so 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 in terms of figure so we have this Pikachu that we want to scale and I think like Starfish um, yeah like having having a formal proof of the security this is really our, our main our, our main goal for now because we really think that it improves a yeah. lot but we don't want to. Uh, but the, qu the question yeah. was like oh, sorry. <laughs> what kind of scale in the future would you like to support? Oh uh, yes well you know. <laughs> as much as possible, maybe 10,000 of hundreds of thousands of nodes. Sorry, I misunderstood your question. Um, yeah, yeah, we really want to, 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 to scale to like tens of tens or hundreds of thousands of nodes. And also, this is like why we have um, IPC um, to help us uh, scale. And, and actually, also Starfish, I think this type of Starfish or expected consensus, this type of like longer chain where you don't really have like that much voting, uh, they scale much better than, for example, BFT. Um, so yeah, so we expect to scale to, to many. Thank many you. Places. Thank you.